Hi, my name's Jez, and I'm going to talk to you about Tide's self-service service mesh with console. All right, so first thing to get out of the way is we are Tide. We're not Tide. Tide. We do uh, a modern business current account that gives time back to people who work for themselves. Uh, we've got about 350,000 members in the UK. That's about 6% of the market. Uh, launching soon in India. Check us out. We're also hiring. That's who we are. Nothing to do with washing. All right, so behind the scenes running all that stuff, we've got about 250 engineers, 120 services uh, across around 30 teams. We deploy on average 15 times a day. So we've got some scale, some complexity. We're not the biggest, we're not the smallest, right? There's, there's some stuff going on. It's chunky. And we run Amazon ECS for, uh, for all of that. Um, ECS backed by EC2 instances. We're not on Fargate. Um, and you can see a few interesting things there. We have Gravity, which is a third-party API gateway that works really nicely for us. Uh, we have a bunch of microservices. We have Kafka in the mix and some RDS databases. Um, and that's a setup we like. It, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, so what do we need console for? Well, uh, this picture is kind of a lie. Call it an abstraction. Um, because the picture is actually more like this. We have this internal uh, Amazon ALB, an application load balancer. And that's how all our services talk to each other. They all go from the service to the ALB back to the other service. Um, and that's kind of, well, it's okay. It's something that we did a couple of years ago. We, we had like eight services. Um, and it's a whole, it makes a whole lot more sense in that picture. In this picture, it starts to get a bit untidy. Um, we also don't have any um, control over which services can talk to which other ones. If they can access the load balancer, they, they can talk to, to whatever. Uh, so we wanted to fix that, right? We wanted to, uh, to make that better from a security perspective. Um, we wanted to make that better from a reliability perspective as well, because although that's an Amazon managed ALB, they're pretty sturdy, it's still kind of a single point of failure. So what we needed really was a service mesh. Uh, and we didn't have one because when we started with ECS, there really there just wasn't one available. Um, and we spent a long time looking at Amazon App Mesh because that's kind of the obvious choice if you're using ECS. Um, and we found it had kind of a few problems. Um, I think it's a fine choice if you're starting from scratch with ECS today. But because our ECS environment is a little bit older, it has some assumptions built in in the way things work. Uh, it's really hard to like retrofit uh, app mesh into the picture. And there's a few call outs as to why. Firstly, Ingress, uh, that Gravity uh, API Gateway product that I talked about, uh, is really just another service in our, in our cluster. Um, and app mesh doesn't really have good support for that. Obviously, they want you to use something like Amazon API Gateway. Um, so services within app mesh have a limit on their upstreams, the number of other services they can talk to. And that limit is 10. It's an AWS service limit. So you can apply to have it increased, right? But 10 is very low. We have 120 services. Our API gateway needs to talk to most of them. 10 just doesn't work. And I think with Amazon service limits, they're kind of hinting at, at, at intended infrastructure, right? They're saying, this is 10, right? So if you need 200, you're doing something wrong. So that's a conversation we had with Amazon uh, support. And they were like, oh, yeah, it doesn't really work. We couldn't find a solution to that. With console, it's not a problem. Actually, there's no limit in that way, but there's also uh, uh, an ingress model that, that's better that, that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, MTLS as well. We wanted MTLS communication between all our services. You can do that that mesh out of the box. That's fine, but you need uh, an AWS managed private CA. And I'm kind of stubborn about AWS CAs because they're so weirdly expensive. They're about $400 um, a month. And it's like, it's not a lot of money, but it's also like quite a lot of money. I don't understand that pricing. And it bothers me because we need one per environment. And, uh, you know, in if we're running in multiple countries, that, that doubles up again. And it's just like, it just seems odd. I don't understand that product. It bothers me. With console, it's not a problem because the TLS certificates are issued internally. Nobody has to worry about it. it uses console magic, right? Another thing we discovered with AppMesh. Ultimately, we want to lock down global egress, right? We don't want to have services just going, hey, internet, I want to talk to you. Um, and you can do that with that mesh, right? That's a design goal of, of the mesh. But you have to have all or nothing. You have to have every service the same, right? So every service has to be using MTLS, and then you lock that down. That's very hard when you already have an installed base of services in, in an existing cluster. So that was difficult for us to get our heads around. With console, again, it's a little bit more flexible. You can do it on a per service level. You can just tweak things. So it gives you a path from here to there. And you can uh, you can start to kind of play around with 
enabling that for some services and not others. Again, the flexibility is really what we needed. The next thing we have is, is we have a, a few services that expose more than one port. And maybe we're doing it wrong, I don't know. I think there's a good argument that says if you're exposing more than one port, then you secretly have more than one service, right? But that's not the story we have. We have a few that do uh, both gRPC and HTTP. We have some that just have like a management port. It's a situation we're in. With that mesh, we were looking, this, there's just no solution for this in that mesh. We were looking at, okay, well, do we need to actually split our services? That puts a lot of engineering overhead on our, on our teams. There's all those teams. We don't want to have to have those difficult conversations. This was a real stumbling block for us. And again, with console, this isn't a problem because the flexibility is there. Um, and finally, and this is a really interesting one, AppMesh doesn't have a good story around developer ingress. And by developer ingress, I mean, I have a laptop, I'm developing something, and I want to go and poke a service that's internal within the mesh that wouldn't necessarily be publicly routable, right? It's not necessarily something that is connected directly to our API gateway, but I want to, I want to poke it. I want to do stuff with it for debugging or whatever. Uh, and AppMesh has no story there, but actually the console didn't really have a story either. But um, we spoke to Amazon about it and they were like, oh yeah, I don't know, maybe an ingress proxy per service, but that's like <sighs> expensive, doubles our compute, whatever. Um, with console, we figured out a way. We haven't implemented yet, but I'm going to talk about it because I think it's interesting. Um, but again, that flexibility kind of gives us, uh, gives us options. So that was kind of how we went through. We tried out mesh and we got through that process and then we were like, oh, maybe console. Um, as well as that stuff, we had a couple of kind of key drivers. Firstly, the ready-made control plane thing. Uh, so we use HCP, actually called Cloud Platform. And that just gives you a console control plane straight out of the box. And it's similar with AppMesh, right? AppMesh's control plane is just it uses Amazon Magic, whatever, you know, have to think about it. So we didn't want to have anything more complicated than that. And HTTP seemed like a good fit there. As I kind of hinted, we needed it to be easy to configure for our engineers. We needed them to be able to set up their services to use this quite easily. Um, so that was really important for us. Um, intentions, which are the things that control which services can talk to which other services, are something that we wanted really fine-grained control over. So we wanted to find a separate way of governing those. I talked about API gateways. I talked about gravity. Compatibility with Gravity was obviously an, an important thing to address. And developer ingress. And then finally getting console up and running without any significant downtime. Ideally without any downtime. That was our aim. So this is the picture we wanted to end up with. We wanted to end up with HCP peered into our environment, uh, acting as our control plane, and all our services talking to each other through console sidecars that are marshalling that connectivity. It's a good picture. I like it. How are we going to get there? Well, firstly, that ready-made control plane. So this is the picture. I love this picture because it's full of arrows. What you've got here is HCP at the top, VPC peered in. That's really easy. Get your credit card out. They give you a peering ID. Job done. Then you've got some options. So you can see here I've got two example ECS tasks. And an ECS task you can think of as roughly analogous to a, a Kubernetes pod if you prefer that world. So it's a, it's a private network space which your task runs in. It has a service container that obviously is doing the most uh, the, the meat of the work. And then you have two sidecars, console agent uh, and envoy. And you can see the console agents all sort of talk to each other and figure out what's going on and like, hey, what are you allowed to do? What am I allowed to do? And then envoy is what's actually doing the, the, the traffic and doing the MTLS. There's other options for this. If you're using ECS, which we are based on EC2 instances, then you can run the console agent as a daemon on each host. So instead of having uh, an agent per service as a sidecar, you have an agent per container host, per machine. Um, and we kicked that around. We didn't really like it as much because um, the health checks, the arrows you can see in red here, the health checks, the envoy stuff, are unencrypted. Uh, and that would mean unencrypted traffic going outside the task boundary. I don't know if that's a problem. It just seemed wrong. Maybe having a console agent per host is a little more resource efficient. I don't know, there's an interesting trade-off, but this is the picture we ended up with. I like the picture. Um, I think it works. So from a services perspective, all those complicated arrows disappear and you just end up with a bunch of upstreams on some local uh, port numbers, right? So just arbitrary numbers. In this case, I've chosen 9001 and 9002. 
and your services that your particular service depends on are just there. And I love this picture. I love this picture because you could easily recreate that environment anywhere else. You don't need console to do that. I could recreate that on a development machine. You know, I just expose a port locally. There's my service. I could recreate that in a completely different orchestration layer. I could recreate that on bare metal, whatever, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, so it makes our services that little bit more portable because the environment that they're in is really straightforward. There's no dependency here on uh, you know, that load balancer, on Route 53 entries for service discovery, whatever. It's all just there, and that's really nice. So that's the control plane. That's kind of how it all hangs together at a high level. Once we had that picture, we needed to configure it. We needed to roll it out. So this is roughly how we deploy services right now at Tide. We have a repo. In the repo is the services source code, and we have a doc file, and we have a kind of manifest, which is a bunch of YAML that describes how that service is supposed to work. When you hit deploy, uh, there's a docker build step. Push that up to a registry. And then there's a deployment step which parses that manifest file and spins it out into a CloudFormation template. And the CloudFormation template describes firstly the ECS task definition. Think of that as a bit like a Helm chart. Uh, and it also describes any uh, dependent infrastructure. S3 buckets is the classic example. So that's how it works. Uh, it works very nicely. And we thought, well, the obvious thing to do is, this is an example of that manifest. You can see it defines uh, health checks, it defines ports, CPU and memory, whatever. Uh, the obvious thing to do is just add upstreams into that. Uh, so then there's a couple of lines there for engineers to add to those manifests. And they can define, okay, my service needs to talk to this thing and this thing, and it's going to use these ports. And again, the port numbers are arbitrary, it doesn't matter. They just won't get exposed locally. And so we think that's quite nice. That's just like a, what's that, a three line change, and, and you can use your service mesh. Um, but we could maybe do better than that. Um, so that the way that works is it gets parsed uh, deploy time again, and, and, and the upstream's config finds its way into the, it actually goes into the task definition as a, a, an environment variable that that's uh, visible to the console agent. Happy days, but maybe we could do nicer. Um, so instead of this, if you make it slightly more complicated, you can do something interesting like this. And this is, again, this is a Python application that, that just sits in our deployment pipeline and parses this stuff. Um, so what we do is we allow developers to specify an environment variable that the service will be, the service address uh, will be available in. And we use this magic string HTTP URL, and that gives us this picture, right? So now, instead of having to worry about um, injecting your config uh, to, you know, localhost port, whatever, it's just there in an environment variable. And because a lot of our services use Spring Boot, if you use a Spring Boot property that's named to match your environment variable, then that Spring Boot property is automatically populated. And now, all you have to do is that one change to your manifest and your Spring Boot properties automatically contain the address of your dependent service. So that's even easier. That's nice. That's genuinely just a very small change and everybody's using the mesh. This property uh, gets automatically populated, as I said, and then um, you can, we kind of had fun with this, right? You can def define a few different options. Um, uh, you've got HTTP, as I mentioned, you've got gRPC, um, TCP, if it's just, you know, protocol or whatever. Um, list, which is kind of useful for um, injecting into uh, HA proxy config. Um, and there's also template, which will just drop the port number in somewhere magic. Um, so you can define a kind of uh, you know, boilerplate paths in your APIs or whatever. Um, so that's quite nice. Nice and flexible. You can kind of do whatever you like with it. Um, and it matches up to the Spring Boot config, and it, it just kind of takes some of the uh, overhead off of engineers who are adopting this. So that, we, I like that. I think that's, that's fun. Next thing is intentions. And intentions, as I said, are really important because they control what services are allowed to talk to what other services. So here's a bunch of services doing their thing, talking to each other. If I do this <clears throat> without an intention, that's just not going to work. That's going to get blocked. I have to put an intention in which is a, a configuration within the control plane. I've put an intention in to enable that traffic to happen. So that's quite powerful. The reason that we wanted a service mesh, or the primary reason we wanted a service mesh, was so that we could control this stuff. So obviously we have this flow, right, where we're deploying stuff. 
and we define these upstreams and that gets peer reviewed by a pull request and then it gets deployed. So one option would be to just have that piece of configuration drive the intentions, right? So if I say I'd like to talk to my target service, then we create an intention for that piece of connectivity. And then it's zero additional effort. And that's cool, but it's also kind of scary because security. So what we ended up with was uh, this picture <clears throat> where intentions are configured separately, subject to a separate pull request, which we peer at very carefully, and then deployed. And you can see uh, the configuration looks like this uh, allow from structure here. That is all in a single repo. So all our intentions are in one repo. It has a lot of controls over it. It has a lot of uh, you know security folks peering at it. Um, and each service basically has a YAML file, uh, and that YAML file defines what services uh, are allowed to talk to the particular service the file is for. So that kind of mirrors the upstreams. The upstreams are, I would like to talk to X, and the intentions, the allow from construct is, I will allow Y to talk to me. And you can play around with that. There's a lot of options there. We thought about, uh, you can have allow from, you can have allow to, and you can have deny from and deny to. And there's a precedence order, and it starts to get very complicated if you use more of the, uh, the different kind of flavors of allow or deny. So we just stuck with allow from. We might do like deny from for a few specific or, or, or deny to for a, a few particularly important services or you know where we have particular concerns. But I think having this mirror the upstreams is, is, is a pretty nice structure for the general case. Uh, it gets deployed with a, again with CloudFormation with a with a, a custom stack, uh, a custom provider. You can do this with Terraform. There's a there's a Terraform provider for it. Uh, we just uh, we use CloudFormation to deploy our services, so it made sense for us. But by all means, use Terraform. We we, we do use Terraform for uh, for um, our kind of underlying infrastructure. We just don't use it for services. So, uh, but it was easy to do either way. You just really behind the scenes are poking the uh, console API. Next thing was Gravity. And we like Gravity. We like it a lot. It's it's really flexible. It has like a plugin architecture, so our auth fits into it. You can do really interesting things with uh, SSO through it. You can do uh, all, all kinds of fun with it, right? It's it's really flexible, really powerful, um, and we're very happy with it. Um, and the way that engineers use it is there's a graphical interface where they go and configure their routes. So obviously we could have defined it as another service in the mesh, and have it define upstreams for all the services that it wanted to talk to. But that would be a really long set of upstreams and that would be a code change for every deployment of a new service, right? We'd have to go and make that code change and we'd have to go and configure the routes through the graphical interface. And again, it just seemed clumsy. We have all these engineers and they're very busy and they're very expensive and I just kind of didn't want to waste their time with it. Um, so there's another option, which is roughly this. Um, our API gateway is outside the mesh. There's an ALB in front of it. Uh, where traffic comes in from the internet. That's just for, for high availability, just load balancing between the different container instances. Then we have another ALB, again, for high availability, just load balancing between different instances of a console ingress gateway. And this is just console running in another mode. It doesn't have a primary container. It's just being an ingress gateway. It's just allowing traffic to whatever. Uh, and then really simply, any service that needs to be addressable from the API gateway has in its uh, intentions file an allow from gravity mesh ingress. You can see that. And that just allows uh, the ingress gateway to talk to the service. Gravity just talks to the ingress gateway. It's really nice. Uh, and uh, it's very flexible. And it means that in order to make a service uh, publicly accessible from the API gateway, you just configure the route in gravity's graphical management interface. And you configure the intention uh, within your own services. Uh, intentions file. Job done. So we were really pleased with that picture too. Um, the last piece, second to last piece, sorry, was developer ingress. And I talked about this and I said this is kind of experimental, right? We haven't actually done this yet, uh, but we have a good plan. And we talked about it a lot with, with HashiCorp while we were setting things up because we really wanted to make sure we had a good story. We didn't want to get to the point where the mesh is all ready to go and then all of a sudden like, people can't work. So that's really important to us. It looks like this. We've got a developer, they're using their laptop and they want to connect to some arbitrary service within the mesh. Not necessarily one that's addressable from the ingress gateway, right? It's just something in the middle that they need to poke for whatever reason. So if everything's locked down with the intentions and the MTLS and whatever else, well, how do you do that? Well, 
We think it looks something like this. Firstly, we have a pool of agents within the mesh that are just there for developer purposes. The reason they're in the mesh is because they use this gossip protocol to stay in touch with their peers. Uh, and the gossip protocol is a little bit uh, sensitive around latency. So if it was talking over the connectivity from a developer's laptop, obviously we're all working from home nowadays, there might be somebody's on a train, somebody's in a cafe, whatever, the connectivity is vague and we didn't want to have that cause an impact on the wider cluster. So we keep those within the mesh, within the ECS cluster, sorry. And then on the developer's laptop, we have a Docker container that's sort of specific to this purpose. Um, the Envoy proxy is on there. And there is a configuration file, much like that upstream config file that we already saw, much like that manifest. And you configure that file, you just say, well, okay, well, today I'm talking to the X service and the Y service, so I'll map those to this port and this port. You boot up the container, it joins the mesh and everybody's happy. Uh, and we think that works, think that works really well. And it creates that same environment that I talked about where the service, in this case, the service under development, just has a local port and it talks to the service that it needs over that port. You don't have to have a separate configuration file for local work versus development environment versus a production environment. It's all just there on the same port uh, and it works. It's really nice. Um, and I think that's a good picture. We're going to roll this out soon um, and we'll see how it works. If, if other people have solved this in other ways, it, it fascinates me, this problem, because uh, as I said, there's not an obvious story. Nobody's documented this anywhere that I can see. So I think this is really interesting, um, but I think that picture is one that we're happy with. And the final step is just rolling it out, right? How do we do it without any downtime? We're going to go from this messy picture A to this tidy picture B. Um, and we're going to do that basically in a few steps. We've already done this one. We add the agent deployment to our existing deployment pipeline. So now we have, after a while everything gets redeployed, we now have an agent running as a sidecar next to every service. It's not in use yet, it's just there doing its nice agenty thing. Then we ask the developers to enter that upstream's configuration in each service's manifest and define those intentions. We're not yet going to enforce those intentions. We just define them. Then after a while that reaches a degree of saturation and we can just monitor that internal ALB that I talked about. You get good analytics from CloudWatch. You can see what's uh, what's going through it, what's, what's not. You can see per target group. And we see each target group, uh, which references each service dropping, dropping to zero as services get deployed using the mesh. So the traffic through the ALB goes to zero. That's the stage we're at now. That was where we got to. And the last pieces are really just tidying up, mopping up. So that will be, once the internal load balancer traffic reaches zero, confirm all the mesh traffic is aligned with intentions. We're not entirely sure how we're gonna do that, but I think it's okay. Enforce those intentions, and then we're done. So there we go, we've adopted console. Um, it did take us about six weeks to get to point three, but I think then there's kind of, because we have this large number of services and this large number of teams, there's kind of a long tail of services that need to get caught up as part of our usual kind of maintenance cycles. So if we, if we hurried, we could probably do it, right, really quickly, but um, it just fits in with all our, all our other priorities and, and, and gets deployed uh, as part of the natural cycle of development. So that leads us to a point where we're ready to switch on the, the intentions enforcement and the mesh is up and running and everybody's happy. Um, so that was our, our journey with console. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you very much.